Okay, this morning we're going to be picking back up and looking at the book of Revelation, and we're going to be looking at the mind of the one having wisdom, and this would be in Revelation chapter 17, verses 9 through 15, is what we're going to be focusing on today. Previously, we were talking about Mystery Babylon the Great, and looking at that particular name. It is Mystery Babylon. It's not a mystery, but she is Mystery Babylon, so it's Mystery Babylon in a or it's Babylon in a mystery form. She's referred to as the mother of harlots. Of course, in looking at that, you know, and that she is in a mystery form, that means we're not going to be able to go back into the Old Testament and fully see any details about her because she's in a mystery form. But that doesn't mean we can't understand what is being referred to here. She is uh, seen as the mother of harlots. And of course, in looking at that, it's talking about religious things, religious matters. So she's not just the one and only religion in the world. There's a whole bunch of other religions, but they basically come off of her. They're based off of her, or she would be the primary. <clears throat> she is drunk with the blood of the saints, which, you know, this would be again during the tribulation period. Uh, this We're not talking about the church saints. We're talking about tribulation saints here, where they are going to be uh, killed for their witness concerning Christ and concerning the truth, because she doesn't want anything to do with that. And we're going to be back to that, to where we're going to have those religious sacrifices. And remember, when we were looking at that, uh, that is the killing, the term that's used there is that uh, killing for a sacrifice. So they are considering what they're doing to be something that's related to a religious sacrifice. Or another way of putting this, is they're putting heretics to uh, death. Then we have the mystery of the beast, and we were looking at that a little bit. In the context there, he will be actually killed. We know that this happens around mid-tribulation period because there's going to be a breaking of the covenant shortly after this. Uh, he will be resuscitated. He is not going to be resurrected. He's going to be resuscitated, so he's going to be brought back to life. And it's very interesting how Scripture describes this, and we went over that last time in a lot of detail, where... He comes from the abyss, and that's very specific to pay attention to because humans go to the lowest Sheol, they don't go to the abyss. And we were talking about, you know, with Sheol, Scripture describes three specific sections in Sheol. One would be paradise. Of course, that's now in the third, or up in next to the third heaven after the resurrection of Christ. Paradise is where all of the saved uh, pre-church saints went. And then we have the lowest shield where all of the unsaved go, that's human. And then you have the abyss where you have spirit beings. Those are where the demons are being held. Um, some of the demons right now are being held. During the tribulation period, the abyss is being opened at certain times because we have demons coming out and they're, they're uh, causing a lot of problems with humans, more specifically with the unsaved because they're not allowed to touch the saved ones. So a demon from the abyss is permitted to bring his soul and spirit back to his body and sustain the physical life. Because again, he's being resuscitated. He's not being resurrected. So he needs something to sustain that physical life because it was terminated. Now to humans, this is going to look miraculous. And they're going to see this person. The unsaved of the earth will be caused to wonder after the beast. He was dead and now he's alive. Who can possibly make war against the beast? the mind of the one having wisdom is now where we come into in in revelation 17 verse 9 where it says here is the mind of the one who the one having wisdom now remember wisdom is a proper use of knowledge so we need to take the knowledge and then we need to use it correctly so he doesn't say here is the mind of the one who understands he actually uses the word wisdom here so this is the mind of the one who has wisdom, the proper use of knowledge. So the angel is going to explain what the symbols mean so that we can be wise concerning them and how he's revealing them to us and we can understand these things. So, you know, it is important to understand, especially in relation to Revelation, that we of the church can understand Revelation. It was written so that we can actually understand it. Uh, sadly, there are a lot of people who misinterpret it, and it causes a lot of problems. 
But the reality is we actually can't understand the book of Revelation and what, it, what its purpose is and what it's telling us. Remember that God is the one who gives us wisdom without upbraiding it. So he's not making the book of Revelation something that we have to kind of decode and decipher. In most cases, we just have to actually follow the context. Now, it does jump around, but if you're paying attention to what's going on, you can follow the context in the timeline. James chapter 1 and verse 5 talks about the fact that God gives us wisdom and he doesn't upbraid it. Um, here in the NAS, it says generously and without reproach. But if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And that kind of has the idea of he's not going to give it to you all wound up and you have to unwind it and figure it out. He's going to be very plain about the wisdom that he gives us, a proper use of that knowledge that we have. There is no mystery hidden within the book of Revelation. And again, that's something that we need to understand because otherwise we could not be ones who have a wise mind in relation to what's going on. We wouldn't be able to understand it. So there's no mystery there. Revelation reveals what is going to happen to the church. Remember in the first uh, three chapters, we talked about that is the history of the church. In the fourth chapter, the church is in heaven. It talks about the world system and about Satan, the unsaved, and Israel, because ultimately Israel will come into the land. Will God will fulfill the promise that he gave Abraham. Revelation deals with all of that and gives us the information. It is written in such a way that requires the Holy Spirit to knit things together, just as all scripture is written. So it's not, so a lot of times unbelievers will misinterpret it because they're really not looking at it from a spiritual sense. A good example of this is implying that out of like the trumpets come the vials and out of the vials the bowls, etc. But that's not actually the way scripture, not, not the way Revelation is laid out. Uh, we see like with, with the example that the trumpets are actually at the same time other things are going on. You know, and we're looking at that. It is not done through a private interpretation. A lot of private interpretations today in relation to Revelation. There are a lot of commentaries on Revelation that just really, honestly, they just slaughter the book of Revelation. And they, and they really make it a personal interpretation of that person who is writing the book. And that's not the way scripture works. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 talks about this, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Applying what you think it means to Scripture is not an appropriate way to take Scripture. As a matter of fact, we would not do that with any other book. Think about an, instructional, an instruction manual, and everybody just decides how they're going to interpret that instruction manual. Not going to work out very well if they don't take it literal. Matter of fact, it's going to work out pretty disastrous sometimes. You know, so it's the same thing with scripture. It's not of one's personal interpretation. Now, as we get back into Revelation chapter 17, verse 9, we see the seven heads here um, that it's referring to. And, and seven mountains is, of course, referring to Rome. So we have the seven heads and the seven mountains and how it's describing them. So this is in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 9 again, moving on. The seven heads are seven mountains where the woman sits upon them. Now, historically, Rome is the only place known to be built on seven mountains. Uh, this is actually important to pay attention to because there's a lot of people and a lot of things coming out today where they want to say, I've actually heard uh, Portland is, uh, there's seven hills in Portland, therefore it's going to be where the, the harlot resides. And there's seven hills. Oh, I've heard it in Seattle. I mean, it's almost like any city that somebody really wants to focus on, they find seven hills. And that's not actually what it's saying. It's not saying it's literally built on seven hills. It's describing a historically known place at the time of the writing. And the only place known historically to be of seven hills is Rome which means we're talking about the physical location of Rome. That is where she is going to reside. Uh, as a matter of fact, it specifically refers to her as the city a little later on. 
So we can't take uh, known places today and apply them here. That's not that's not appropriate. As a matter of fact, what we're doing when we do that is we're we're inputting scripts uh, things into scripture that aren't actually there. And the harlot will rule ecumenically from Rome, the physical city of Rome. And that's what scripture is actually describing here. You know, most of Revelation, remember, it is focused around Rome and the Roman Empire and Israel, not focused around the whole world. Focused around that particular area that at that time that it was written was the known world. So you can't take that information and then apply it over to America. And we've talked about this. I mean, you know, is America in the book of Revelation? Not in the book of Revelation. We're kind of possibly in a reference to prophecy as uh, cubs of the lion, which the lion would be a reference to Britain. But that's about the best we get. We're not centralized. She's going to rule from uh, Rome. She's She doesn't have political power. She has religious power. The beast rises from the revived Roman Empire. That's where the beast is actually going to come from. The beast is not going to come from America. The beast is not going to come from the UN. The beast isn't going to come from whatever other place you want to say that, well, people want to say they figured out who the beast was and who the man of lawlessness was. That's not what scripture actually said. The revived Roman Empire. It's not, by the way, from the Vatican City. And this is actually kind of important because technically the Vatican City or the Vatican is actually a separate country. It's not actually Rome. Now it's it's in the city of Rome, but it's not actually Rome. So, and and the reason I say that is because it's not implying that it's going to be Catholicism that is ruling the world at this time. As a matter of fact, there's other passages as we go through this, we'll see Catholicism is involved with it, but is not the predominant one. Okay, so we have a harlot that is, again, a mystery. So that mystery would be, even though we understand it, hasn't been revealed yet. Then we have, they are seven kings. So it's referring to the seven in Revelation chapter 17, verses 10 through 11. And also they are seven kings. So talking about the seven mountains there. Uh, some of our translations will just say, and which you know is, is okay but i think you kind of miss the point of what he's saying there uh, because your word and can also be used as also and in the context you kind of need to determine what he's saying is he saying something separate or is he really kind of expanding on what he's referring to so here he says here is the wisdom or here is the mind of the one that has wisdom the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits also, they are seven kings. So the seven mountains is also being used to refer to the seven kings that she's going to be over. Five have fallen, one is, and another is yet to come. And when he comes, it is necessary he remains for a little while. So here we get kind of a little bit of a picture of the different stages that the revived Roman Empire is going to go through during the tribulation period, because there is going to be some changes that actually do happen to the leadership. It starts with the 10 kings. Remember the 10 kings, and we'll go into this with a little bit more detail here, but the 10 kings are given power for one hour for the purpose of being able to give their power to the man of lawlessness. So we start out with the 10 kings. Shortly after the man of lawlessness takes power, then we have seven kings because he uproots three of them. He completely takes away their power. So because they want their power back. So he uproots them. So we have a change in the leadership, even though it's still referred to as 10 kings, uh, because they would be the, the original group. Actually, three of them have been destroyed so that he cannot, so they can't take his power away once they've given it to him. Then we have the resuscitated man of lawlessness. He's yet to come at this point in the way we're describing here. And of course, he's going to set himself up as king. He's going to set himself up as the one and only ruler of the entire world. And that would be the eighth stage that it will be in. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 11 talks about this. And the beast which was and is not 
also himself is an eight, and he is out from the seven and goes into destruction. So he's going to be the final one where he is going to uh, rule. Now, the book of Daniel actually gives us a lot of good information on this. And that's really where it's talking about. It's talking about world empires and starting, of course, with the, with the head of gold. Um, I'm not going to, uh, you know, well, I was kind of going back and forth whether I should go into detail with this. And I think I'm not going to because Peter's been going over this also in, in Daniel and other passages. So he's kind of already talked about that. So I'm not going to go um, specifically into that area, but understand it's coming from the book of Daniel where we get a better understanding of who these 10 kings are and what's going on. And really the whole entire um, history behind uh, the world powers. So now we have the rise of the new Roman Empire, or you could say the revived Roman Empire. Either way, this is in Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 through uh, 14. We have the 10 kings, of course. And the 10 heads which you saw are 10 kings which have not yet received a kingdom. Now you'll notice here, they have risen. To, he, he's showing what's going to happen to bring the man of lawlessness onto the scene. And we have 10 kings who don't have a kingdom yet. But they will receive authority as kings for one hour with the beast, which means they're not going to receive their authority until they actually give it to the beast. At this stage, the kings have not received their kingdoms. So in the, and we're looking at, of course, the timeline. So we're going back really just before, right after the rapture, just before the signing of the covenant, what's going to happen in there. So remember, the rapture is not a, a sign of the beginning of the tribulation period. I know a lot of times it's, it's pushed that way. But what does scripture actually say is the beginning of the tribulation period? It's the signing of the seven-year covenant with Israel by the man of lawlessness. Well, the man of lawlessness has to come into power before he can actually sign that. So we have probably, honestly, between three months, maybe at the max six months. I don't even think it'll be honest. I think it'll just be a season. Probably be about three months between the uh, church being raptured, being taken off the earth, and the man of lawlessness coming to power. And that's kind of where we're between right now. So we have the 10 kings. They haven't been given power, but they actually are going to be given it. And so the revived Roman Empire won't be present until the man of lawlessness is actually revealed, which means we as the church won't know who the man of lawlessness is because he's not going to be revealed until this actually happens. Today, we will not see the rise of Rome. That is, the church isn't going to see this. The, the uh, UN, because I, I remember this from years ago, the UN is not the revived Roman Empire. Uh, ten nations that all of a sudden were not ten nations, and then there were more, and then the, you know, and it goes back and forth. Scripture is pretty clear. Ten kings are going to rise. It, and these 10 kings are going to bring the man of lawlessness onto the scene. Well, really, they're the ones who give him political power because he's going to rule. It's actually the uh, harlot that brings him into power onto the scene. They receive their authority for one hour for the purpose of giving it to the beast. So you can't say that they're present today because they only receive their power or their authority as kings for a sufficient amount of time to give it to the man of lawlessness. A very short amount of time. When it says one hour, it's talking about a very short amount of time. They give their authority to the beast, all being of one mind. So they're all going to do this in agreement with each other. They're actually going to give their authority to the beast. This is interesting, by the way. Have you ever heard in the history of, of humans of a king willing to give up his authority as king to another person, to another person who has no actual right to their authority. That is what's going to happen here. Revelation chapter 17, verse 30, they have one opinion and they give to the beast their inherent ability and authority. So their inherent ability, that word power is their inherent ability. That would be the, authority, the power that they have in relation to their kingdoms. They rule over their kingdoms and they're actually giving the beast or the man of lawlessness 
their authority to rule, and um, they're also everything that goes with it. They will wage war with the Lamb. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14 talks about that. These will wage war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them because he is Lord of those lording and King of those reigning. And the, um, and the called, even elect, even faithful with him. So they're actually going to come with him when he actually comes and he um, conquers them. Now, the harlot is seen as over nations and peoples and tongues. So we're kind of going back quickly to the harlot here in the, in the description, Revelation chapter 17, verse 15. And here it says, and he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And of course, that's important to understand because it's actually defining what they're referring to in chapter or verse one, when it says that she's over many waters. In Revelation 17, one, it said, then came one of the, <clears throat> to try this one again, then came one out from the seven angels, the one having the seven bowls. And spoke with me, saying, Come, I will show to you the judgment of the harlot, the one sitting upon many waters. Now, here is defining those many waters as nations and peoples and tongues. Okay. She is going to have ecumenical authority, and this is in the in the religious realm, over nations, pretty much all of the nations. And it's also not going to just refer to nations. It refers to the people and the tongues within the nations she's going to have authority over. Yeah. The kings are drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, remember, in the context of fornication, is referring to spiritual fornication. She is going to present a whole lot of different gods, a whole lot of different religious practices. And that's what it's talking about with fornication. And you see that they're drunk with the wine of her fornication, which would indicate they enjoy her religious system. It is set up to make them, well, really happy about it. And they want it. They want to be involved with it, these 10 kings. And we have Christ warning to some of the assemblies who will join with the harlot. We do not have right now really a very clear picture of exactly how this harlot is going to be, but we have some revelation that relates to her. And what I mean by that is, again, you can't go back into the Old Testament and you can't pull information out and say, Mystery Babylon the Great is, is a religious system that's not re revealed in, script, in the Old Testament, but it is revealed now in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation. She's going to be religious, and she's going to have daughters, which means there's going to be these off, uh, offshoots of her. And that, of course, is important. As a matter of fact, some of the assemblies that are actually churches are going to follow her. Now, I want to be careful with the way I'm saying that, because during this time, the wheat is going to be removed before this happens. And what I mean by that is we go back to Scripture in the way it describes it, and we're talking about the, the parable of the tares and the wheat. The tares are those who are acting as children of the kingdom of God. Now, there is a difference between the kingdom of the heavens and the kingdom of God. The tares are ones we see today who are in the church who act like Christians, but they're not actually Christians. And they don't believe that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. That's not what they base their salvation on. They base their salvation upon other things. Oftentimes today, we see, you know, salvation would be, I mean, they talk about the death and resurrection of Christ, but then they say to receive salvation, you have to repent of your sins, or you have to accept Jesus as Lord of your life. But Scripture doesn't say that. Scripture says you have to believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. It's very interesting, by the way, that wheat in tares is actually used. Because a tare, there are only two times in its life you can tell a difference between a tare and wheat. It's birth and it's fruit. While it's growing up, they look exactly the same. And we get the same thing today. We get people in the church, they look just like normal Christians but they're not Christians, they're terrorists. Now, the wheat is going to be removed before what I will talk about here is going to happen. 
Matthew chapter 13, verse 38, where it talks about this. And the field is the world, and as for the good, this is the proper seed. These are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. That would be the malignant, the evil one, Satan. He went and he sowed them around into the field because, you know, he, in his enemy, in the way that it's describing that. The harvest is at the, is at the end of the age, Matthew chapter 13, verse 30. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall the end of the age be. And that's when they are gathered finally and destroyed. The city or the, the assembly of Thyatira is one of these assemblies that is going to be one of the daughters of the harlot. Now, it's not the entire assembly. It's the assembly that is really made up of those who are not actually believers. And now remember, we have this plague, this, this wheat and tares going throughout the history of the church. So in each one of these uh, seven churches that he's describing to, he's dealing with those who are tares along with those who are actually true believers, overcomers. Because, and typically, what does he say in, in those? To the overcomer, I will give. Who's the overcomer? First John talks about that. The overcomer is the one who believes that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. Not everybody in these assemblies is believing that, and he's dealing with that. So in Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29, this is the church of Thyatira. And in here we see where it says, Behold, I will cast her into a bed. I will cast her into a bed, and the ones committing adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they change their mind out from her works. Now, in the context, what it's talking about is the, the harlot Jezebel. And Jezebel is one who comes in and she's teaching. We see this in uh, 2 verse 20. She's teaching really the servants to fornicate and to eat things sacrificed to idols. But I have against you that you have forgiven the woman Jezebel, the one calling herself a prophetess, and she teaches and deceives my servants to fornicate and to eat things sacrificed to idols. This is an assembly that's claiming to be a church that's actually doing this and involved in this. Some will not repent from her. And if they don't repent, they're going to be cast into uh, tribulation. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 21. And I gave her time in order that she should change the mind. Because remember, your word repent literally means to change your mind. And she did not desire to change the mind out from her fornication. This, by the way, is a representation of Catholicism. Think about what Catholicism does. It brings in idolatry. You know, Catholicism puts Mary above Christ. Among many other things. Okay? That's what it's describing here. So we see that Catholicism will be really a daughter of the, of the harlot, the great harlot, but not the great harlot herself. The church of Laodicean, Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. Christ is outside the assembly. He's knocking on the door of the assembly. That's not appropriate. And in the context, he's not knocking on the door of your heart. Keep it in context. It's the door of the assembly. This, I thought this assembly belonged to him. Why is he knocking on the door? Hey, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand over the door and knock. If anyone should happen to hear my voice and opens the door, I will enter in towards him and I will dine with him and he with me. It is a wealthy church, but it doesn't have any doctrine. Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. Because you said, I am rich and I am in a state of being wealthy and I have no need. And you do not intuitively know that you are wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. It's a good description of many of the churches today. They're very large churches and they're very wealthy. But they don't have doctrine. They don't want to teach the truth. You talk about sin and, and, and overcoming sin and, and Satan and how to, you know, oh, no, no. They want to stay in the Gospels, teach you uh, a modified version of um, the Beatitudes, which isn't correct, so that you can apply that supposedly to your life, which really is self-effort 
And they don't want to live by grace. They don't want to teach that. It represents liberalism in religion today, progressive theology, allowing perversions into the church that are not appropriate. The scripture very clearly says this is not to be in the church. The church of Laodicean will also, and these would be, of course, those who don't believe, because the one who actually responds is not going to be facing the wrath of God, but the rest are going to go. And then we also have the church of Sardis. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6 is where we get this one. It has a name, but is dead. Kind of interesting in the way it's describing that. Here in verse 1, it says, To the messenger of the assembly, the one in Sardis, write these things, the one having the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says, I intuitively know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, and you are dead. How can you be alive and dead? What it's describing is Reformed theology today. Reformed theology does not present the gospel. They don't even understand the gospel. If you really, in many cases, if you really finally boil it down to what they say you need to believe, because there's a lot of different offshoots, it's kind of like you need to believe the whole Bible in order to be saved. But does scripture say I need to believe the whole Bible to be saved? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, believe that Christ died for your sins and buried and rose again on the third day. Okay, Reformed theology is something that they are dead. They don't have truth. But they take a name as though they do. And they claim the name of Jesus, but they don't speak the truth. So these ones are actually going to be going, these are uh, uh, really daughters of or again yeah, because she's the mother of harmony so they're really the daughters but not again a representation so the christian church as you see it today is not going to be uh the the harlot catholicism is not going to be the harlot reformed theology that's not going to be the harlot the harlot is in a mystery form so we don't see her today and we won't see her until the man of lawlessness is going to come onto the scene which means we of the church are not actually ever really going to see her in a clear way because we're going to be gone before it can happen. We have to be raptured out before this can actually happen. So in looking at this, the mind of the one having wisdom, Revelation chapter 17 and verse 9, it says, here is the mind of the one having wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains where the, where the woman sits upon them. And then in verse 10, it goes on, it says, also, there, these are seven kings. Uh, five have fallen, one is, and one has, yet, has not yet come. And when he comes, it is necessary he remains for a little while. And the beast, which was and is not also himself, is an eighth. And he is out from the seven and goes into destruction. And then, of course, we see the rise of the Roman Empire. And the ten heads, which you saw, are ten kings which have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings for an hour with the beast. These having one opinion, and they give to the beast their inherent ability and authority. These will wage war with the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them because he is lord of those lording it and king of those reigning, and, he, um, and also the called even elect, even faithful with him. Now with that, um, I didn't quite get to the harlot being over the uh, uh, nations, but in verse 15, here it says, and he said uh, to me, the waters which you saw is the harlot sitting there, or sits, these are peoples and crowds and nations and tongues. So with that, we're going to go ahead and uh, pause for communion at this point. Um, and then, God willing, we'll pick up next week and looking at some more details on this as we uh, get to the destruction of the harlot that's coming up in verse 18.